Well, I've been doing podcasts now for over three years and 150 plus podcasts on the Art Dealer Diaries. So I figured, you know what, maybe I'll take a little break for the next uh, eh, couple months and uh, hopefully come back with some new episodes in the fall. Uh, there's lots of things I want to talk about. And I've really never talked directly about why I do the podcast. I mean, I've mentioned it at times here and there, what you know the, re the reasoning is. But, you know, it started a long time ago, about 10 years ago, that I really thought, you know, I want to capture voices of people that are in my profession. Uh, specifically at that time, I was thinking more of the dealer community because we're getting older, I'm getting older, you're getting older. And uh, I thought that if I captured these voices, they wouldn't be lost. And not only would they not be lost, but hopefully the individuals that you would listen to would come through, their voice would come through and tell the story of why they do what they do. You know, why do we go into Western or Native American art? What's the, you know, impetus? How do we get there? What's the story, right? And they all have a story, an interesting story. And that's what really started to um, captivate me when I started the podcast. And originally, I thought I would just film the individuals and have maybe a history, something that I could share with the world and, and document. But when the podcast forum really took place, and through the um, insistence of my son, who said, you know, Dad, you should really do this, this is the way to do it, I thought this is what I want to do. And I also want to be able to reach younger people that might go, wow, this is an interesting field, Western art and Native American art. And so it kind of metamorphosed from me doing just an interview of dealers to something more inclusive um, and exclusive, writers, um, photographers, artists, art dealers, art critics. And as the name of the podcast, which is the Art Dealer Diaries says, really, this is about the people that come through my life, right? The people that I see uh, that I might never see again in some instances. They just come in and I think, you know, God, I'd love to talk to this person. And hopefully if I'm doing my job correctly, it's really not so much about me as it is about the artist or the guest that's on. And that's the key. And that's what I'm hoping I'm getting through on these podcasts is that you get a sense of who these individuals are and where they come from. And, you know, I've learned so much about my world since I've started doing this. I really have. And that's, I think, been fascinating for me to come to understanding why artists are artists and why I do what I do. And there's themes that I keep finding and I think it's important for me to keep searching for those themes in upcoming episodes. But like I said, even Mark Sublett needs a break once in a while. And this is going to be my break for the next few months. So one of the things that I've done uh, for uh, a couple of videos, which I think you'll enjoy, is I kind of took the highlights of some of the artists uh, and individuals that I've had on. And these will be uh, the next two videos that I produce will really be kind of highlights. And you can go back and listen to these individuals in full because most of these last anywhere from an hour to as much as three hours. And so I picked just some people that I thought were interesting, like Mark Maggiore and Mark Winner and uh, the Dene artist uh, Tony Abeda and um, Kim Pion, who is the director of Swaya and... Uh, Baron Wallman, who was really interesting, who was one of the individuals who's passed since I've started doing this show. And he was the photographer for Rolling Stone magazine. He was an owner as well and was in Woodstock. And that's the thing. If I don't capture these voices and if I don't do these kind of uh, shows, they're going to go away. And it always kills me when I hear of somebody I know who was important in my world and they're no longer around. Right. And it's like, God, I should have captured that person. Why didn't I capture that person? Well, I'm going to try to over the next few years. We'll continue to add, and I hope you enjoy my show on the Art Dealer Diaries. So until back, I get back in uh, the fall, enjoy going and reviewing the shows that I've done, and uh, hopefully you will find them as enjoyable as I have. You know, you kind of breezed over. Yeah, we had signing records, and you did a hundred. You sold a hundred thousand albums, right? 
something like that. A bunch, that. yeah, more than yeah. that. From yeah, yeah more than that. I mean, you were a big, I mean, you were and still are, you know, to a lot of your fans, a big, you know, a big band. was Playmo, right? Is that how you say it? Yeah. yeah, yeah. And is it kind of a metal band, metal rock? I've listened to your music. Yeah, it was, it was the wave of 2000. Uh, I mean, the, the late 80s, uh, you know, after Rage Against the Machine, you know, started that, you know, movement, mixing hip hop and metal. Uh, and so we were definitely part of that wave. Uh, and yeah, I think, yeah, French kids always listen to American music. It's, it's always been like that. You know, everything that comes from America is great. And that's probably from, you know, the 60s. And it's always been like this. So the wind blow this way. And so I was one of those kids, you know, I was, you know, like, but that one day I woke up thinking, shit, if we make a band, why don't we sing in French so people can understand what we're talking about? And I think that was a great idea because how many bands were in Paris trying to, you know, reproduce Rage Against the Machine and all that. And there was a lot of bands and trying to sing in like, so the English doesn't make any sense because we are not American. We were not speaking the language properly. And to me, it was like a phony. I was like, it can't work. Like if we sing in English, what are we talking about? It's just retarded. So I was like, we're going to sing in French. And so at the beginning, it was like, Ugh, it sounds weird. Like, you know, because we're used to the American sound and music. And all of a sudden you put French on the lyrics and it's different. It's unique. And it was hard to accept it uh, you know, with my bandmates and I was like, okay, well, that's how we're doing. But then very quickly we realized the impact on people and the kids singing the lyrics and, you know, and like we got famous so fast. Like we uh -huh. recorded a little demo and I was like 20 and we brought that demo to the, to the store, the record store across the street in Paris. And, and the guy was like, he was blown away. He's like, I'm going to put this on the station so people can listen. <laughs> and, and I'll tell you guys how it goes. And we were, we were so stoked because we were a bunch of kids. And he called us a week after. And he's like, hey, you know, like so many people are listening and asking what it is. You have more CD? I'm going to sell them. And so we were like, whoa. <laughs> so we, we were able to like uh, press like, I don't know, 200 or 300 copies of that demo. And the guy sold them all. He's like, hey, I want to do a showcase. You guys can play in the, in the, sh in the store. So we're like, what? And so <laughs> they planned the show like for like, you know, I don't know, a week after. And we get there the day of the show. We just came with our gears. And there was a line. It was in the Place of the Opera in Paris. There was a line all across the street of like kids like us, like long hair, dreadlocks. And we're like, what are they here for? <laughs> and that's for us. <laughs> And we haven't been able to play because the minute we started, it was the biggest mosh pit in the store. All the stuff started to fall apart. And so the security stopped us and we couldn't play. We haven't been able to play. That was really funny. But so that's how it pretty much started. And then from there, you know, we got, we got signed with big labels and, uh, and, and we toured everywhere. Um, but we, yeah, and a lot of other bands starting to do the same. We encourage people to sing in French. Because it made a huge difference for the fans because, you know, of course they would you'd idolize the American bands more. You know, if we'd play with Korn, it would be more for Korn because you're from America. But with us, it was a hard because they understood what we were talking about and we were talking about stuff that they were relating to. So that was the key of it. And, um, and it was cool. Took it, and then we spent 10 years playing and recording albums. <laughs> uh -huh. so, and going all over the place, right? You toured. Yeah, yeah. We toured everywhere but in America. So that's, again, an interesting thing. It's like, uh, you know, American uh, book, bookmakers, uh, they would never, they're not interested in us because they're like, the audience is not ready to listen to something else than American singing. Uh, I mean, English singing. So... It was tough so, because every time we were playing with American bands in, in Europe, they were like, dude, you guys are the shit. You need to come to America. <laughs> well, like, we wish, but <laughs> I guess we can't. It's just uh, not just us deciding. It has to be a tour. So, yeah, that was it. And you were doing the artwork for your uh, albums and that kind of thing at that time? Yeah, I was always uh, pushing two career at the same time. So I, I was the tricky part is... Because when the band started to work well, I was in art school at the Academy Julian, and 
I had to do my thesis in the last year, and the, the, that one year we were on tour. So I had a, one of the craziest tour of my life when I would like go play and took a night train or a flight and go back. And at 8 a.m. I was on the class, you know, sketching <laughs> nudes or, you know, painting stuff. And then at like 4 p.m. I had to go back on a taxi, go to the station, meet the others that were traveling in the same time. But I made it or I had to do it like I couldn't give up on on none of them like I wanted to succeed in art and I wanted to succeed with the band like it was you know and my parents were supporting me with the art and I couldn't fuck up and say oh no I, I give up on the school and I loved it too so it was like I, I just had to do both so yeah I was pushing both and when I finished school I started getting jobs as you know uh, illustration or um, music video uh, directing and um but i was in the band at the same time but it was cool because i was in the music industry i knew a lot of people and so a lot of people would give me jobs because you know we were friends and you know at sony i did a lot of artwork for a lot of sony artists because i was there and that's cool what did you do and, what, uh, yeah. what sony artist did you do do you remember which one did you do I mean, French artists mostly, no, nothing uh, American, only French stuff. And uh, I did this very famous hip hop band called NTM. Um, they were super big back then. I did the whole music video um, in 3D animation. That was pretty awesome. Uh, but also, yeah, I had the opportunity that, that year to um, go to America to work for Disney because I was also a lot. Um, relation with Disney and I was I did a bunch of internship with Disney at the same time and when they gave me the opportunity to go I, I was too much involved with the band and I was like I can't leave France I had to stay so I, I kind of like gave up on that um, thing yeah uh, the Disney thing which I was kind of like over it at a certain point anyway um, and a lot of Disney artists told me you know don't go <laughs> it's like a wishing machine <laughs> <laughs> and uh but i always had a lot of respect for you know disney artists because there's so many good artists that work for um, disney and dreamworks and um so it's something i wanted to do but you know again you have to choose past sometimes and, right. and do you think choose, part of it was just for getting the invitation you know you got the offer you're good enough for sure you know and it's like okay 100%. You know, yeah no i get that i totally, 100%. <laughs> I totally get that i know <laughs> Yeah, as soon as I knew they wanted me, I was like, it's fine. Yeah, I don't need to go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's all I need is the affirmation. They wanted me. Now I'm going to go work where I make this money. Yeah, probably. Yeah, so it had to be kind exactly. of a weird di dichotomy that, you know, you clearly have two parts of your brain, the, the music and the art, and the art is, is, is obviously very, very important. It has been. But now you're doing this band, which is super successful, and you still want to you still want to be an artist right so how do you deal with that um i think it just uh starting a band when you're 20 uh, you know it's gonna end like it and I, I had enough my head on my shoulders to know there's gonna be a time where it's gonna be over and so i was always enjoying it every minute and you know putting all the energy needed because it was such a great experience and and every show every every time i we i was feeling so grateful that you know this was happening but i knew it was gonna end and so that's why i was always you know keeping other jobs and keeping relationship with you know all the people that were giving me jobs back then and um and yeah i was mostly directing music video uh, after a time uh, I dropped, you know, illustrations, works and stuff like that. I was really, music video was worth fun because I get to travel. And so it was a really good time where I was in the band and then also directing music video when I had free time. And so it was cool. But um, it's funny because during this whole time, the painting thing, because painting has always been, you know, deep in my heart since art school. And, but I had no idea that, you can make one dollar being a painter like to me it was like yeah it's even worse than being a singer in a band it's like there is no way you can make money being a painter so i was like maybe when i'm old you know i'll, I'll have a house in provence and i'll just be that guy that's just painting landscapes and and whatever <laughs> but it was always kind of a dream 
of a long-term dream, really long-term. So when I was thinking of the after band, I was imagining myself directing music video and maybe all three directing movies. That, that was what I was hoping to do, is directing movies. So um, we stopped the band in 2008 and I directed my first feature film in 2010. Um, which we did with my uh, music uh, music video company. Uh, we produced my movie, and it was a big mistake because we should have go through um, all the the cinema industry to get the fundings and all that. But we decided we thought we were smarter, <laughs> and we wanted to do the movie on our own so nobody can say anything, and then we would sell the movie to distribution. Uh, but it didn't work like that. So we did the movie, and it was great. But then nothing happened it was too difficult to enter find you know because it's such a such a lobby uh, world uh cinema industry is locked like you have to be part of it you have to know people you have to be you know if if, if you're not in bed with anybody nothing's gonna happen for you so um it was good for me because i just decided that i was in america here um with a movie that was never gonna be sold to anyone I was fed up of doing music videos and I had to look at myself and be like, okay, I'm 35. What am I doing in America? I want to stay here. What can I do that would set me apart? What are my strengths? And I'm in front of me or, and it's like, well, it's painting, dude. <laughs> <laughs> you were born in Santa Fe, right? Uh -huh. And so mm -hmm. what, what did your parents do? They went to IAIA, right? Were they right. artists, I assume? Yep. So my dad, um, I, I would say that his number one art was music. He <laughs> actually came to Santa Fe um, and was studying piano. And he was studying to be a concert pianist. Wow. And so I had the pleasure of growing up in a home with Rachmaninoff and Bach and Chopin and all of those things and so but he was also a, a silversmith and um and he also did a lot of other um very artful things so it was something that he did all of his life what my mom was a painter she was a painter what's her name her name is Annabelle Lazard and yes. does, does she still paint so she does. Um, yeah. And it's so funny because she's like, you need to paint. And I'm like, uh, I, I, I don't know how to hold a brush. <laughs> uh -huh. Question and is that she applied yet to try to get into Swaya <laughs> with her paintings. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's a good thing. I think that it's a good thing to, um, to definitely take that on and, and be who I am in it. And if it's bad, it's bad. And if it's good, it's good. But um, as far as SWAI is concerned, I think what I bring to them is just uh, truly business acumen. I, yeah. I'm a businesswoman, and that's how I operate. Yeah, I can already tell that. I've just met you, but I can get I, I see it already. I'm already <laughs> feel thrilled for all the SWAI members and the native mm -hmm. artists that you have. <laughs> so, so how long were you in Santa Fe as a kid? You were born there, and you're... Oh. Yeah, so I actually, um, we, we actually lived here until I was about eight years old. Yes. So during that time, my father, after um, graduating from IIA and having taken on a family, he, he really needed to find um, provision that was sustainable for our family. And so mm. he went to school and became an RN nurse. Mm. And um, so he worked for Indian Health Services here in Santa Fe. And uh, I think he just needed to get home because his parents were getting older. And, and that's how we ended up back in Cherokee. And you moved when you were eight? Yeah. So that was a, probably a little traumatic, actually, going from Santa Fe. It, it to, was traumatic. You know, it was Cherokee. definitely a traumatic, it ver a very pointed time in my life, for sure. Yeah, I can imagine. And, yeah. and at that point, what did your mom do? Did she continue to paint? So my mom, she was she was a, a housewife, and um, I think that you know for her she was also just trying to adapt. I, I think that she never intended to move on to another reservation, and right. you know <laughs> having to. I mean that was and that was a hard adaption for our family. Sure. Yeah. So um, it's it was one that was. Um, a good decision, but it had its consequences too, just in reference to how do you, how do you cope with, with that? Right. Change. And it's not your tribe either. Right. 
Mm -hmm. you know, and I've interviewed a lot of artists that have this inner tribal, you know, issues that they have to deal with. You know? Totally. And, yeah, we had Marla Allison on yesterday, you know, and she's Hamas, Hopi and Laguna, you know, and she grows up in Laguna. And so I'm sure you probably felt some of that as well growing up there. Right. I mean, you were, you know, the kid that was not Cherokee, even though you were. Yeah, even though I was. And um, no, definitely those things. I always felt uh, growing up that I uh, knew other cultures, but not my own. And so when I went to work for the Colville tribe, that was the first time that I got to live on that reservation, mm -hmm. work for my people and become a part of that that community. And um, I fell in love. It was it was it was a really awesome experience that really completed me as a human being. Um, I've been on that journey of identity. I think what you're talking about is identity. That's right. And, and who are we and where do we come from? And just even in these native communities. And so I had the pleasure of um, marrying a man who was a member of the Spokane tribe of Indians. And so we lived on his reservation for 19 years. Mm. And, um, and so the Spokane tribe, um, I consider them family and they will always be um, a very beloved community to me and my children, because my children are descendants of Spokane's. And I think I have two grandchildren, no three, I have three grandchildren who are enrolled with that, with that tribe. So and so what is your, what do you consider your tribal affiliation? Do you have one that you, I mean, cause you grew up, your formative years were in Cherokee, but the years where you really became in touch with who your mother's side was in Washington. Yeah, I think, so I, I think that in reference to this whole thing about where are you enrolled right. and what is your blood right. question truly right. comes from this federal system that, that impacts us in a very adverse way. But for me personally, I feel like um, first and foremost, I'm Native American, right? And I represent every Native American tribe in 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 on this on in the United States. Yes. But beyond that, I think equally, I am I'm Colville and I'm Cherokee, and and those those are the tribes that I that yeah. I were. That's what I was born into, and so yeah. And how I, about your kids? What are they? What are they? They they're, yes. they're different, so right? So my children are all enrolled Colville, um, but I have grandkids because of just these laws that we are subjected to by tribal governments. They're all very different. Mm -hmm. um, and so like I have um, my kids, when they um, had their children, they couldn't be enrolled to Colville unless they had married a Colville. And so I have um, some grandchildren who are enrolled Cherokee. I have some grandchildren who are enrolled Spokane just based on those tribal laws. And so wow. I, I think that's interesting. Yeah, that is interesting. And that's impactful too in, yeah. in ways because that's your identity, right? Whether you yes. want it or not, you know, I grew yes. up in New Mexico. I look at myself as New Mexican. I live in yes. Arizona. I have for a long time, but if you ask me where I'm from, I'm New Mexican. So, yes. You know, and, yes. Uh, so they have you know what was interesting is just when I took the job and when I came here, um, just the heartfelt welcome home was oh, so impactful to me. Like it was the first time in my entire life that I actually had this very welcoming and warming welcome home. And um, it still chokes me up to this day just to know that um, regardless of where I'm employed or what I'm doing, that New Mexicans were like, our, one of ours have come back. That's and right. So that, that's awesome. Yeah, and that's true. That's how we do feel. <laughs> yeah. You, you were born in Santa Fe, you're a New Mexican, you grew up there partly, and now you'll spend the last most important part of your life, hopefully uh, leading uh, Indian market as well. Yeah. So I'm driving along thinking it's just another concert, right? And I get in this line of traffic that's moving about one mile an hour. And I'm supposed to be there already. Are you coming in on Wednesday? On Friday. Oh, you're, you're, oh man, you're coming in right well, at I, I yeah. know. So um, I was like, what do I do now? You know, AAA maps? Yeah, sure. I had my AAA map with me back before there was Google Maps. Right. And I said, there's got to be another way around 
to this spot where they are. Right. And I, I looked at it. There was a parallel county road. I mean, really parallel. I took a left turn, then a right turn, and sped up there, and I was there in 20 minutes. <laughs> I mean, I'm, and uh, this is the other thing I, I don't often tell. As I got close, there was a motel there. I stopped and said, do you have any rooms? <laughs> They did. No way. Yes. Well, of course, most of these kids had no money at all, right? Well, but I mean, <laughs> even the ones with money had to stay. They had to camp. Or they had to, and I had, you know, when things got bad, the rain came, I went back. So you got room. the hotel. Did you pay in advance so you made sure you had your hotel? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Because <laughs> that was a very prime thing. And so you could get to that with your car. How, do, how would you get to that logistically? How would you get to I that? I drove to it because this back road, nobody was using it. Yeah. I mean... I, I, well, they left their cars 20, 5, 5, 10, 15, 20 miles away and walked the rest. Yeah, that's right. I mean, it was just a line of cars, right? Yeah, it really was. So you were able to, so you show up on Friday. And who do you have to go report to at that time? That's, I have no idea. I, I don't know. I mean, I don't know who I report to. <laughs> you're question. 30 at this time, right? You're a 30-year-old. 30, 30, so you're 32. one of the, 32. So you're one of the older people at this time. Yeah. Level. Well, I was, I was 30 when we started Rolling Stone, and, um, you know, at that time, you weren't supposed to trust anybody over 30. Right. But there I was, <laughs> the chief photographer, they better f trust me. In fact, we'll, we'll backtrack it right here, yeah. because that's really kind of a critical component, is that um, the fact that you were the, the photographer for Rolling Stones, right? Right. And so that happens in, uh, you meet two people that were influential who were just getting ready to start that, right? So you, Ralph Gleason was one of them, right? And he yeah. was the San Francisco Chronicle. Jazz, uh, he was really the jazz critic as much as anything else. But he noticed that the music was changing in San Francisco and rock and roll was becoming pretty big, to say the least. Right. And, and so he started covering rock and roll. And he, he kind of became a mentor to Jan Wenner, who the titular head of Rolling Stone, and so and, we and he was young, right? He's a twenty-one year old kid, right? From right, Berkeley, exactly. And, yeah, and that's Jan Wenner. Jan. Jan Wenner. So. Yeah, and uh, you know, he just said, he told me about the idea. It, what they had no name yet for it. Yeah, it was just an idea, and he told me about it, and I thought it was a good. He said, "What do you think? I think it's a good idea." He says, well, do you have 10 grand to invest? <laughs> I said, no, young, but I'll, sh I'll tell you what, I'll shoot for free in exchange for stock in the company. Well, there was no company, so obviously it was easy for him to say, okay. <laughs> but the one thing I did say that has stood me in good stead from that day forward was I said, Jan, you can use the pictures any way you want to, but I own them. And that's an impossibility right now. So... For 50 years, well, I mean, I'm exaggerating for effect, but for 50 years, I've I've lived off of the pictures I took in the late 60s, early 70s. Yeah, because they gave you access to all the names. I had access to all the bands, not only because of Rolling... Well, with Rolling Stone, in the beginning, we needed them as much as they needed us. Mm -hmm. Put it this way, they needed us as much as we needed them. So if they were disinclined to get their picture taken, they suddenly became inclined because they wanted to be in the pages of Rolling Stone. And that thing kind of shot off pretty quickly, didn't it? Really quickly, really quickly. So you got stock, you got... Um, I, I got no money, I got stock. But you stock got to keep all your photos. Yeah, yours. exactly. So that was in... I don't know what... I No, people said, what, you know, what possibly... Uh, cause you to make that condition. Yeah. And I thought back, I've been working for Time Inc., yes. you know, shooting for People Magazine and all that crap. And, um, and it was crap. I, I told them I'd never shoot for them again because they, they were so, they had the lack of compassion. In order to get, they said, you do anything, you get a picture, even oh, if yeah. it hurts somebody. Oh, I, said, I'm said not wow. I said, I'm not a carrion bird. I don't work for people like that. And they said, you'll never work for us again. I, You're right. <laughs> I will never work. Anyhow, blah, blah, blah. But when, 
when you work for Time, back in the day, when you work for Time Inc., you had to give them all your film and everything. And essentially, they owned it. And I, I knew I was making really good pictures that they had, uh, I didn't have access to. So that's, I think in my mind, I was remembering that. And I said, yeah, I'm, I own the pictures. Yeah, so you're just, when you work for Time, they pay you out a fee and say, okay, you get this much for this shoot. And, yeah, and that's we, it. And that's then adios, oh, buddy. Yeah. Thanks for the great photos. I don't know if they steal that. Uh, it's, it's, gotten, it's gotten horrible. I mean, if, if you were a young person that came to me, wanted to be a music photographer these days, I would dissuade you. I mean, you'd have a great time. You'd make no money. Yeah. Even the, even the pros make no money at, at this point. So let's go back. I actually want to go to the part where how you became a photographer because at some point when you were growing up, photos, something, art, photos, paintings struck you, I would bet. Yeah, um, two things. My cousin had a small speed graphic, which was a very cool photojournalist. Oh, no, I don't even think of photojournalists. Uh, you know, the <clears throat> photographers of the day, you remember had that square speed graphic with a light bulb in it, yeah, and yeah. you'd shoot it, and you'd have to change the bulb. He had one of those. But with that, he just showing up with that camera, he could cross police lines. Yeah. And I it'd be where the action is. And I said, I want to be where the action uh -huh. is. So I got myself a camera, not the same kind. And how old were you then? I was a young teenager. Yeah, teenage kid. A uh, very young teenager, 13, maybe 14. Um, but here's the thing. my well, I mean, To this day, it persists, this idea. When I look at the world, I see a lot of chaos. Um, and in the broader sense of the word chaos, the way people handle themselves, the way they relate to each other, the, what, the way they live their lives. And then accompanying the chaos is this noise, I can't explain it. It's psychological, psychic noise, which I always felt even as a kid. But I picked up the camera and I looked through the viewfinder and I could select the moments that had some meaning to me. And there went the chaos and there went the noise and it was almost therapeutic. And you know, I fell in love with the experience and uh, <clears throat> I, you know, for, there'd be periods of time I'd put away the cameras and I'd come back to them and it was like a best friend. It was, it was always there. The experience of pay, taking pictures was always built, you know, made my heart pound, filled me with delight. So that's, that's a story. How I became a professional yeah. photographer. I mean, this was a great hobby. You know, I could get girls to unbutton three, bu three, <laughs> three buttons on their bus. Right. Um, but uh, I was in Berlin working uh, for our side as a counter spy. And so... Well, let's stop right there because that's pretty interesting. I'll tell you more yeah. about that. Um, <laughs> but um, I was there when the wall was built, when it went up, and I started photographing what was happening. That's like 1960? 61. Yeah, okay. And... Um, <clears throat> I took pictures, and I wrote my hometown newspaper. I said, look, there's local. I'm the local boy on the front lines of what could be the beginning of World War III. Would you like some pictures and a story? And they said, yes, and send us what you got. In those days, you couldn't transmit photos electronically. I made prints. I wrote a story. And you know what? They, wrote, they read the whole story, unedited, all the pictures, on the front page of the feature section uh, of one of the daily, or maybe it was a weekend, I don't know, and they sent me a check for $550, which in 1961 probably represented about $500. Yeah, so, and you're only like 21 or something. 22. Yeah. So I'm saying, wait a minute, <laughs> this hobby is paying me money. I'm just going to make it my profession, and that, that was really the beginning of it. That was, you know, bringing back to your question about yeah. what's it like to be in a hometown. It's fantastic because you can be poor and everyone else is poor and you can be, you know, 
you in this like it was a really great place culturally rich with mm -hmm. you know people came in from zuni people came in from hopi um, all over the reservations and everybody came in on saturday so saturday even to this date is my favorite day of all like yes, i mean, uh -huh. love saturdays <laughs> because there's like things going on and i, I still, remember that yeah like you know don't mess with don't <laughs> don't muck with my saturday, saturday. Like That's if funny. Um, I, I actually had this girlfriend and she was giving me grief on a Saturday and I was like, you know what, you, this isn't going to work. I, I mean, Saturday is my most favorite day. You can't ruin my Saturday. Because, well, no, it's like any other day. And I'm like, this is not going to work out. And do you think that's day. also because the money came in because a painting would get sold too and there was more treats and things to be able to. Yeah, because it was paid, sense, right? Because yeah. everybody's getting paid and uh -huh. then they have flea markets and people are selling peaky bread and they're selling mutton stew and sandwiches and and jewelry and everything and people are getting new tires and there's parades down on town and mm -hmm. there's movies matinees and we don't have to go to school yeah no school so yeah and were was, you good at school no terrible student but how about the art part uh i was did okay i i didn't i i drew i made things i built stuff mm -hmm. i you know played with clay nothing ever got fired so it all melted back into the earth uh, but i will say that when I didn't know what else to do with my life, that's when I made the decision to go to art school. And my sisters all were supportive. Like, you you can do it. Yeah. You should go to art school. Uh -huh. Yeah, let, let me, I'll help you. I'll make a phone call. We'll get you into, where do you want to go? And I was like, I don't know. We should go to IIA. Yeah. It's a good school. Uh -huh. In Santa Fe. Yeah. In Santa Fe. And I said, I can't get in there. I have really, like D's, D yeah. minuses. I shouldn't even be saying this to no, people. No, that's okay. You know, most um, of the artists I interview did not do well in school they, as yeah. far as grades, but they all excelled in creativity. Yeah. Well, I mean, I taught at UC Berkeley, you know, yeah. NYU graduate. I mean, yeah. I'm not like incapable yeah. of making decent grades or, you know, dealing with right. uh, academics. But I look back on high school and I barely made it through it. You know, I was not focused. Let's say I wasn't When you focused. go back, have you gone back to any of the reunions? Yeah, and, yeah, I do. <laughs> and do they? They're, so, they're just such beautiful people. You know, yeah. like I, I see classmates and they're still really, like sometimes the, their memories are so tied in with like a particular period of time. Like right, 18, like 1983, right? Right, when you were there. And, and so they remember all this stuff about me and I'm like, <laughs> I, I don't remember all that stuff. Did any of those know that you were going to become an artist, do you think? No, because I didn't know. Yeah, you and didn't know. Would, you didn't know and really until you yeah. went to Santa Fe. No, I don't think, you know, we, we all went to go do different things. And some people still live in my hometown, but I think a lot of people left and went to different places mm. go to go, you know, get out of that, uh, you know, small town groove mm -hmm. and search out. I mean, yeah. I, I almost moved back to my hometown, but I could only handle it for about a week. <laughs> so there I would be. Yeah, I grew up in a, the same small town you did, almost the same size, but on the other side of the state. Yeah. In Portales. You were in Gallup oh, and yeah, I was in Portales. Portales. So similar, I understand. Yeah. I and, mean, there, it's there's some amazing things because it was also the epicenter of... <clears throat> of uh like jewelry right mm. american indian jewelry so i knew a lot about you know lapidary and stonework and all of these things and um all the traders you know toby turpins was friends with my mom and and um richardson's you know was had these vaults and and um i'd go into the back vaults and i could see like you know, just all of this like squash blossoms, right? Six hundred and fifty concho belts, and <laughs> strands uh -huh. of coral. Back in those days, it right. wasn't like the stuff that you see now, right? That gets pawned. It was all the stuff that traders wanted people to right. pawn. Like, is are you going to pawn this first phase concho <laughs> belt? And they're like, well, we'll be back for it. And they <laughs> hoped that they wouldn't because yeah, they would know that this was like, you know, the last leg of really the great stuff and it was all all then and there so so i grew up around a lot of creativity art there were people who were painting there was a gallery there called kiva gallery yeah right? kiva mm -hmm. that's right <clears throat> so that was nello guadagnoli italian-american one of the really early supporters of harrison begay and my father and and just about anyone who picked up a paintbrush and he would give them paper and supplies. Mm -hmm. And I kind of have to give him a shout out because he nice. was 
he was the beginning of like an early form of an art gallery. He sold to all the big major dealers and traders. And he also gave supplies to people when they didn't have it. Mm -hmm. So he really helped the industry. He was really a pioneer in making the work available and supporting the artists. So he paid people in cash. Uh, he just was, he was a good guy. Did you sell him any art? Did you do he, anything? He bought a couple paintings for me yeah. later on, uh -huh. like when I was an art student. Here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And you, think you know, you're more expensive than your dad, right? <laughs> and I'm like, I don't mean to be like that. Yeah. I guess you're not paying my dad enough money. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> you've, been, you've been shipping him all these years. But uh, I don't mean that. He he was a good guy. And he had this little gallery and, and in there would be pretty amazing things. Andrew Sinigin, Quincy mm -hmm. Tahoma. Um, he, he would have some painters from Oklahoma too. People would come through. So it wasn't just the regional people. He had right. other artists. Hopi, he had a lot of Hopi artists too. Pottery and jewelry too. So when you um, left Gallup, that was to go to Santa Fe. That was kind of your first time really away from Gallup? Yeah. So that was like, because you're going to the big city, right? I mean, in a, in a weird way. Yeah, it wasn't that big. It's kind of yeah. it's a lot bigger now. But back then, it was a manageable. Yes, 30, it was a town. Santa Fe was a town thousand back probably back then. Yeah, right. And so what was that like going into Santa Fe? Uh, I was. I think it was you're young, right? What are yeah. you? Eighteen, nineteen? Not even that. Oh, I think really? I went to I went to art school at seventeen, and I was roommates with the with with, with uh, my first roommate was from Berkeley, California. It was uh -huh. Diego Romero. Oh yeah, I and didn't I walked know that. in and he claimed this bed <laughs> right by the door, and I wanted that, and I was like, I, I screw this. I took his bag and I threw it and put it on the other <laughs> bed. Walked down, the guy came, you know, he came yeah. back in. He goes, somebody moved my somebody moved my bag <laughs> off the bed, and I'm like, I moved that bag off that bed. <laughs> He said, I hope we're not going to have problems here because cause I'm here, you know, I'm from California, you know, and and uh, and, and I'm just, you know, I want to be your friend, but but we should make some rules. And I'm like, all right. All right. Anyway, he's this hot shot uh, ceramic artist from Cochiti. Yeah, he's no, he's really, fantastic. You know, he's in the Metropolitan Museum of Art now. I'm so proud. Well, you're in the everybody. Smithsonian, right? Yeah, I got that going yeah, on. Yeah, so I mean, it goes Matt, both ways, right? You know, like, geez, this huh. is this is all really good. He, um, he's 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 married to a really hot shot, wonderful photographer now, and so our circle of people have now gotten the prowess and and attention of ma most major museums. Mm -hmm. And I knew them all when I used to drink with them, get in fights, and you know, Vangelos, and you know, just crazy fun stuff. Mm -hmm. And so. Th this community of people, it would be more interesting for people in the future to look and say like, wow, how did you meet this person and that person? And, mm -hmm. you know. And who like, were well, your teachers were, there at um, that time? Anybody At the know? time, well, you know, my favorite teacher really was Adelie Lolama. I loved Adelie mm -hmm. because she was Charles' uh, uh, Hopi wife. And um, she just was really, re a really contemporary thinking uh, individual with traditional undertones. She taught painting and she taught ceramics and then she taught traditional dance. Mm. So she did all three of those things at the Institute. And so she was Diego's teacher for ceramics. So he learned a lot from her and then, and about, you know, firing things traditionally. And then she was teaching me painting and she had this, she went to Black Mountain College, I think. Yeah, just like and Albers. Married, and, yeah, right. Yeah. And so she had this really progressive edge to her, mm. you know, about design. She would say, your colors are too loud. You need to tone it down. Mm. Make sure, the, but but not too too bright, mm. but but not too, too you know, subtle either. So <laughs> she would, Color I think therapy. most of my pallor, palette I got from Audley, she, she got well, me to see things through you know, an eye that was soft spoken. And so the colors themselves came from, were really derived from nature. And were and, you a paint? Do you, did you look at yourself as that's where I'm going to go painting or were you dabbling in everything at that point? Ceramics uh, and other things too, because your mom liked that. Yeah, man, I tried to run from this painting career at yeah. least three or four times throughout it. And uh, in the beginning I was, this seems, sounds really silly, but I didn't think you could really make a living at art. And people talked about this thing, like, uh, I don't know, uh, like design and advertising or something. So I, I thought maybe I could do 
posters or billboards and draw them out. I mean, I didn't even know what it meant, but yeah. I just thought that's what you had to do to make right. art work. Right, to make so money. I'm gonna, yeah, so I'm going to get back to the, the the real meat and the potatoes of like, I got there to mm -hmm. the IA and there was this big, huge ex exhibition at the at the Fine Arts Museum. I, and and I every interview, I seem to mention the same very seminal exhibition, which was of contemporary people. Fritz Scholder was in that show, uh, Delmar Boney, um, T.C. Cannon, uh, Harry Fonseca, mm -hmm. uh, all the key protagonists of contemporary, mm. influenced by pop pop art at the time, very progressive, 60s, 70s. Uh, David Bradley, I think, was in there. And I looked at the art and I was like, whoa, I want to be one of these guys. Yeah. That's what I want to do. I want to be one of these guys who got great big giant paintings. They're bright colors. You know, uh, Fonseca was painting with glitter. Yeah. His shoulder great. was dripping and making mess on there. And they were just splattered. And I'm like, who does that? Like, clean <laughs> it up. Like, I didn't get it at the time. But yeah. then I, I didn't know that I was like right there at that, that waking moment where contemporary American Indian art had really found purchase in like, you know, the mainstream eyes. What year would like, have that been? Do you remember? I think it had to be 84. It yeah. was the first summer I was there. Well, one of the things I think that for me, and I hear it all the time, oh, I don't have the space. That's never stopped you, right? Never. N never stopped me. I've never considered whether a frame goes with this or that or when I bought it. I mean, no. I may change out frames. I, I've done that on a couple of right. pieces oh, yeah. just to match up what I have. Oh, and yeah, and we, that all works. But, we, you know, you buy what you love, what strikes yep. you, and don't worry about it. You'll find a spot. Well, on the other side of this casita, I think, I don't know if I told you before or not, we built a thousand square foot acclimatized units, completely yeah. sealed, and has, you know, AC and, and heat. And we keep it at 58. And story tracks from one end to the other. And there's 350 paintings, prints, drawings. So, and they're all, you know, provenance. They're all, you know, in our books. We know exactly because we have different stories yeah. around the property. We can rotate anything. Yeah. Right. I mean, I'm. You're a gallery in a way. Uh, yeah, Your own for, gallery yeah. for you. Billy Shank for Billy Shank. <laughs> now, all that stuff, your house and all this art right. is going to ultimately end up in a, a uh, in the foundation. foundation, right? Yeah, we, we, we have a lawyer now, and we've got all this paperwork, and that's our very next move since we've now made this trip you know, to Phoenix and to Tucson to see you and take care of some business. The next thing is now to sit down with him with all the paperwork he's got. And I have... You know, some questions about making this a foundation that has, like, my serigraph collection. I have the only complete collection of it in existence. And there's roughly 55 paintings of mine that I'm wanting to put in that. Let's just see if we can't start this before I'm dead. Right. Yeah. But that's, I mean, clearly in your mind. Oh, yeah. You know, and it has been way before you had a heart attack oh, or any yeah. of these other uh, things. No, I've been planning this for yeah. years. And why is that? What what's what's Why do we, you feel well, it's important to do that? When I bought that property in... Uh, Santa Fe, it was already a significant property because of John Brinkerhoff Jackson, who was the internationally renowned landscape architect. I mean, it was sort of philosophically hadn't been thought of in those terms, and he used to call it the vernacular landscape. So he was quite famous. Uh, he had studied at Harvard, um, taught at uh, Berkeley, and he built this property. And then when he died, uh, he had um, no heirs, and he donated the entire property to a, a foundation there in um, Santa Fe, and we bought it from them. Mm. So I wanted to keep his vision alive. When was that that he built that? Well, he built it in 1965. Yes. And he died in 96. Yeah, it's interesting because it has such a, he seems so much older. Well, it's probably the way we restored it, too. Yeah. When, um, when he had the house, I mean, it was double-thick adobe walls and, and all kinds of wonderful eccentric, uh, you know, deep uh, flared window mm -hmm. frames and all that. But the wood was painted. Mm. Kind of a 60, I mean, wood floors, right. wood ceilings, wood. I mean, there was right. a lot of wood along with this adobe, and I love wood. I mean, I had log cabin, you know, we built... And Jackson, right. so I was ecstatic that I could get a, an older-looking adobe, 
and we just sanded and sanded paint <laughs> with a pile of kids, you know, from college and high right. school forever. And then I restained all that wood to match my Molesworth furniture. Right. And rather than have, you know, really white walls with a high contrast, you know, to darker vigas, you know, we came down to a palette of mid-earth tones uh, that softened it all. But, of course, it made it a little harder to see the art. But I didn't care. And I wanted it to feel like a lodge, like circa 1925, mm. 1930. Like it has that. that feel. Pardon me? It has that feel, for sure. Yeah, Especially I mean, with the Molesworth th furniture throughout. And, you know, I went up to Bandelier, and that was built by the National Park Service. I don't know who the architect was. But I just took photographs of that for reference. I would go down to the... Um, the church right off the plaza in uh, the museum, the fine art museum. Right. I got that auditorium, and you know, and I looked at that stuff, and um, God, it was one other. Uh, but in any case, oh, uh, La Fonda. Yeah, everyone uses La Fonda. How you can know, you not? So that's kind of where my references were to build this. So yeah, it does feel. Hmm, a lot older than and, it is. And it has all those huge cottonwood trees that have been yep. there a long time. No, he planted that stuff. There was only one indigenous cottonwood yeah. tree on the whole property. I got the photo. I just found them again. And it's but just he planted hysterical. them in the he 60s. He planted everything in the 60s because yeah. the water table was so Six, high. That's 60 years ago now. Yeah, <laughs> right. <laughs> and there's springs on the property, and yeah. so we have water where, you know, a lot of the southwest is not. Right. Um, and it's right next to Los Galandrinos. Which has water too, and so it makes it a, and makes it nice to be able to have two museums that'll be kind yep. of back to back. And, we're a quarter mile apart. And do you envision it being something like O'Keeffe's place and in, in uh, yeah Abiquiu? by appointment? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And plus, as you know, it is not just how we restored the house and the fact that we do have that Molesworth collection. We have a collection of prehistoric pots. We have contemporary and historic paintings. We have Navajo textiles which you now are probably the major percentage of those <laughs> like that. all of the house. Uh -huh. uh, and so we have had, as time has gone, gone by, I've gained a reputation for any number of different museum groups um, that, you know, put us on their itinerary. And yeah. even some of these travel outfits uh, that do this commercially, um, well, just from you design. Know. I always thought you have one of the greatest eyes just for design, pure oh, design. I appreciate that. Thanks. And, and it really is. I mean, you can see it in the way you put the paintings on the walls, how you design, <laughs> the furniture that matches the Molesworth that you design, right. the concept of how you go through it and, and how it's, I mean, are you going to have like a Barnes kind of foundation at Sensibilities where, this is where, it's to do. this is where it's hung and you don't touch it kind of thing? Well, I'm hoping that's what's going to happen. I don't know how much I can you know, restrain, uh, but that's, that has been my vision. Yeah, it's I been my see vision it. for more than 10 years. Yes. I mean, this was going to be my last great epic chapter Right. was to do this and leave this vision. And it just keeps being reconfirmed because I have all these different groups who love, that are just saying, Oh, this was our favorite destination. Yeah, no, it is. It's super group. interesting. You know, they go up to Museum Hill, they go to Glen of Good Acres or to O'Keefe's house or, to the museums, um, or over to uh, Nidra Matucci's, uh, which is, you know, historic, and they love our place. It just is uh, less intimidating. It's be, I mean, you can be around the art, and, and it's okay if you touch it. Right. At my house. Right. It's okay. You can walk on the Navajo rugs. Yeah, and, it's and until, right. until it's actually the foundations, and they own it. Yeah, and then I don't know what's then you, <laughs> You'll be probably not around at that point. Right, right. Well, it's interesting because it is a mixture of historic contemporary, because you collect yep. a lot of contemporary artists like Mellon and, and some of these individuals, Zemecki right. and stuff, in your own collection. Oh, yeah. And then you have historic art. You have Native American art. You right. have early Western furniture by Molesworth. So you kind of have the whole gamut, and you're still adding. Uh, yeah, slowly. There's really not much more that we need to, uh -huh. you know, because sure. we've got my mom's house filled sure. up with all this stuff. We're redoing the guest house next. I mean, just bringing it up to speed, changing the the plumbing and the heating, new roof and all that. And, you know, I love to publish, so I yeah, have I an excuse to continue. To make books? Yeah. In the beginnings, 
uh, when we were kids, we were all drawing. And we would have these contests to see who was the best. Now, there would be an outside judge. One of the uh, neighbors yeah. would come over and uh, would judge. And I was always winning. So they uh, just gave up and they just went yeah. into sports. And I had to continue <laughs> like, being the artist in the family. So, And, and the truth of it is, um, if I were to think back on how they were, you know, navigating, you know, the, uh, figures and things that they were drawing, right. um, you know, no, they weren't on the same level. Okay, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now that, that, that's not vanity. That's, not, <laughs> that's just reality. That, that's reality. Well, yeah. and in fact, by the mm. time you're 13, you yeah. are already won a contest. Oh, an right? addict. Yeah. I mean, you I was a show addict, really no? at the, at the, na- at the bank. And... I think, no, no, it, listen, in the end. You, I got tested. My mother w- really was a wall. She wanted to stop me from drawing and painting and like uh, she because they were, yeah. I was doing terrible in school. Uh. So they would give me a test paper and I would draw all over it. And so I was uh. just like you know incorrigible. So yeah, she, she just she, thought you didn't care. Yeah, of course. Yeah. So I mean, and you're growing up in the hood. It's yeah. like you know it, it would look like that. And she didn't know what I was going to become or what. And I did, I was an addict, so I couldn't stop. So the only thing that did get her to stop, you know, like, uh, uh, you know, like uh, trying to sort of um, uh, get in the way of what I was doing, so I started making money. Mm. Uh, you know, I was doing drawings in the neighborhood of, of you know, you know, like uh, of, of, of people and their portraits kids and, and porches, yeah. and you were bringing in money. Right. And that stopped, you know, all this like harassment because it was like, okay, where's my cut? I was like, <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> and did so, you have to give a cut? Uh, oh, yes. <laughs> yeah. Oh. <laughs> no, no, no. Money is money. You know. So it's you like, learned about uh, dealers oh, right off no, the no, bat. No, right yeah, off. Right off. We're talking. Cut. I would have been like at that time, probably when I was making money, maybe about um, ten. Wow. And then when I started exhibiting, it was making even more money. So I was 13. So like uh, that was your first show. That really, was the first right? exhibition at the bank. And then I started exhibiting at the library. And then yeah. graduated to Westport, Connecticut, yeah. and started exhibiting there in the country clubs. And then of course moved into New York to go to school. And I stopped doing that type of work. Right. Then, like then yeah. I was following like artists like Maxwell Parrish and Norma Rockwell, yeah, right. okay. uh, the Wyatts, and yeah. like um, and because like, I I didn't know any better. I thought this is what art was yeah if it's realism and tight it has to be good yeah, art, right? and I, I didn't know who you know like when the picasso exhibition came to uh uh moma that was when i had a real taste of what uh the fine arts were that was 1980 right? that would have been 1980 but like you jackson like Pollock, I, I was number? introduced to jackson yeah no, 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 i know you've done your homework so <laughs> smart man but <laughs> but i think that in the end uh it, it certainly was jackson pollock who really introduced me to uh, the fullness of of abstraction, yes, and the possibilities of what you know what was out there for me, and Picasso just sealed it, yes, and so from there it was like you know I said you're not going to be doing any more of this illustrations. It's like uh, which I started to understand that this was illustration, yes, and this is actually fine art, and it was one of those debates that continued when we were in school when I was at Parsons. That was one of those debates. And when I got the Cooper Union, it was it continued there too. And that because, was the first school. So you went to Parsons for two years and then yeah, you finished and got your degree. You got at it. Cooper Union, right? Yeah. <laughs> You're good. Yeah. <laughs> 1985. I yes, think. that's right. Yeah. That's yeah. right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But that, you know, like uh, uh, Cooper was a great testing ground because you had, you know, really great teachers there. Uh, Jack Witten, uh, Ked Zapkis. I mean, it was like, it was just an array of like, a, you know, a, a teacher who's going to, who are going to challenge you. And they saw something in what I was doing, even if it was like, you know, a prettified surface, which is what really, uh, in the end, uh, if you're an illustrator, you understand like uh, how to stylize, how to capture, uh, you know, but with, you know, like uh, the next, level would be to sort of peel back back, peel back that surface and be able to penetrate and get at the substance of what all this is about. You know, the abstractionist is like And were uh, you doing that at Cooper Union? Were you doing Yeah, I was experimenting. I mean I I was doing all kinds of stuff. Yeah, you were trying to find your voice, you think, at that point? Absolutely. Uh, I knew that uh, you know like uh, uh, that there was something beyond that surface. And what that was for me I didn't know. Yes, but I knew that in order to sort of uh, 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 to meet that, I needed to tie my hands, and that's what I did. Literally, it was like tying my hands and say, "Okay, you can no longer paint. These are things that were good at. No more drawing. No more painting." You stopped doing uh, that at about twenty-one, right? Something like that. That would have been about right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> but you did that because 
you realize if you stop that and you that would open up the because your creative juices are going to have to flow right you they, can't they, stop I, that, I couldn't right? stop and yeah. it's like but I needed to sort of like at least challenge my get to the next place and how do you do that by uh, if you're using crutches all the way through you're really not going to learn how to uh, uh, maneuver and walk. So I think that you need to sort of continue to challenge myself. To this day, that's still the case. Mm. I mean, but those were the beginnings of uh, my challenges. Uh, the new challenges are just what we spoke, we were speaking about earlier. Right. Uh, you know, like, a, a, you know, like a, you realign yourself with former parts of yourself in order to sort of like learn what the new self is. So uh, now when I say that, I know I'm standing on the shoulders of many artists. You know, I'm not alone in this. Right, all artists. Yeah, do this. exactly. I Good mean, the, the very idea that you know, like uh, that you're coming in and you're uh, reinventing the wheel is like you know one of those falsehoods. And I think that you need to sort of um, uh, be able to sort of take a step back, uh, uh, understand that it's a collective. It's an it's an experience that actually is about uh, all of us. It's not just you. Uh, and how you're how you're perceiving things, but it's it's actually you history and how you make adjustments and add to a continuum of history. So, uh, so it, artists like Nevelson and Hess, those would be people that you would be able to relate to. You think in your I own work? think they, them, and I think others, and I think that they will also you know align themselves with artists and you know and, and we're part of a continuum. Yeah, we, so yeah. we're not we're not ever coming into this, you know, um, whole cloth I, as a, you know, yeah. as a full on, you know, like, uh, no, that doesn't happen. I mean, like you look at Picasso's work, there was an exhibition at uh, MoMA um, uh, called Primitivism. I don't yes. know if you remember right. this exhibition. Mm -hmm. it was, it's very controversial yep. for all the right reasons. Um, it was a good thing they put that exhibition together, but the premise was ass backwards. Uh, it was the idea that like uh, these artists actually were uh, civilizing in some way right. the, uh, these <laughs> natural abstractionists. So you look at right. the African mass, yeah. the, uh, the oceanic people. Right. I mean, and what you know Picasso was doing with them. It's just like no, he is actually building on right. a, a very very sound uh, 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 artistic ground. basis. Exactly. Right. So it's like so 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 so. The, the, the very idea that, no, no one's coming into this like without actually standing on the shoulders of, of, of his predecessors. Well, even Paul, even, you know, if you look at Jackson mm. Pollock, mm. he says that in his abstract paintings, the mm. ones that he, you know, the strips, mm. sand paintings, Navajo sand paintings. He watched them make it mm. going around and he got the... So generous to actually allow us into that, right? Yeah. To let us know yeah. that... that, that he didn't come into it like you know, like uh, he wasn't in, you know reinventing anything. No, you know he, he, it was all there, and yeah. he un he saw it and he added to it. Yep. He, you know, he stood on top of that, and then actually now gives respect yep. to those things that like uh, that that influenced him. And I think that this is the mark of uh, of not only a, a an honorable uh, man, but a one that is actually spiritually connected and understand that there's a cosmic reality to things. It's not just about uh, 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 these things that you can actually touch and feel, uh, you know, that, that is only the, 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 the top layer. Uh, beyond that is something far deeper, more spiritual, and in the end, it is the one that's more lasting. And, and it continues throughout, and it penetrates all of us. But it's, you know, if you're an artist, you're allowed to sort of ha actually have a peek into it. And, um, and embrace it. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. If you're pulling nine to fives, it's very difficult to, to <laughs> take, you know, the time out right. to sort of embrace another side of you. And uh, that Do you always yeah. try to embrace mm -hmm. that when you're in the studio that you don't that's look? natural. That's that's natural happenstance in the studio. I mean, yeah. you don't try to do anything. It's the fact is you've been doing it all your life. You understand it this way, and you understand also that you need to sort of continue to sort of push uh, past and add to. Uh, uh, life will be um, tiresome and boring if you sort of like uh, uh, just harp down the same yeah. you know theme all the time. I, I couldn't do it. Yeah. Well, I think great <laughs> artists can't. I think mm -hmm. they mm -hmm. have to push themselves to get to that other mm -hmm. level. And I think mm -hmm. for you, from what I can see, is mm -hmm. that you really do go in episodic runs of ideas starting mm -hmm. with number eight right mm -hmm. i mean let's Absolutely. might as well go into that because yeah. that's a that was a very important piece that you did right yeah. i mean that's 1988 when it really kind of right. comes <laughs> together yeah 
<laughs> <laughs> hey, I gotta do my research. I'm interested. You want something. I don't want your pieces. I want to know who, who I'm buying from. Well, number eight, yeah.